the introduction to zoology notes and part one of those the three sets all right so starting off with some basics zoology itself is the study of the animal kingdom the word breaks down into two parts the prefix of the word is zo meaning animal and the suffix is ology meaning study of or knowledge of so for example biology is a study of life bio meaning life virology is the study of viruses um, immunology is the study of the immune system mammology is the study of mammals so pretty much in science everything has ology at the end of it because it's a study of something right and it um, so zoology um, is a subset of biology um, it's one of the broadest fields in all of science just for example there's 20,000 known species of bony fishes alone there's 300,000 known species of beetles at this moment in time um, and we're constantly discovering more and more animals as we get better with technology and examining the DNA of all these um, animals, we're realizing that there's even um, more species than we thought they were. Just by looking at them, they might look similar, but on a genetic level, they end up being a different species. So it's um, just an extremely broad field, and a lot of zoologists will actually speci specialize in a more concentrated area within the animal kingdom and focus on like one type of animal or a group of animals versus knowing everything about all of them, because um, that's quite a lot. So there are a lot of subdisciplines of zoology. This isn't even all of them. This is just a handful. Um, if you're majoring in biology next year in college um, or whenever you head off to college, um, these are just some of the names of classes you might see as options um, there. Um, so for instance, fifth, fish is ichthycology, birds is ornithology, insects is entomology, Reptiles and amphibians are grouped together for herpetology. That's a class I took in college. Mam mammals is mammology. Spiders is arachnology. And parasites is parasitology. And again, this isn't even all of them. This is just a few. There are plenty more of them out there, but I didn't want to waste your time going over all of them. All right. So what makes an animal? What do we... What did scientists decide are some things that all animals need to have in common to separate it as an animal versus a plant or bacteria or other things? Like what made it an animal? So there's four th main things that we focus on. It's that it has to be multicellular, which if you remember from biology class, that means it has more than one cell. So no animal has just a single cell. Right? It's got to be eukaryotic, meaning it's going to contain a nucleus. So it is prokaryotic is the other option without the nucleus. Animal cells have a nucleus. Then it's got to, the third thing it's got to be is a heterotroph, meaning that it's going to obtain energy from the food it consumes. This calls, means it's a consumer. So some other organisms out there in the universe, in our world, um, they produce their own um, energy. We as animals do not do that we're consumers and then the fourth thing is they lack cell walls for instance plants cells have cell walls animal cells do not so these four things you need to know and that's what at a basic very basic level determines if something is an animal or not All right so breaking down some of these things a little further um, for specialized cells so there's animal cells in general they're eukaryotic they don't have cell walls um, but not all animal cells are the same all right. So back in biology, freshman year, you guys learn like the organelles of the cells and you might have got on a little bit of the specialized cells, but they pretty much just focus on the a basic general diagram of a cell every year. But know that within the animal cell, like eukaryotic cells, they take on specialized roles within that. Um, so not all animal cells are the same. There's going to be nerve cells, there are muscle cells, blood cells, and you probably already know this, um, but just how they look is all very different. And as we get into some of these organisms, especially in the beginning when we're looking at some really basic organisms, um, the cells, we look more at the cellular level because the cells do most of the work, or really they do all the work. Um, but just know that they look very different and their roles are extremely imp important. All right? So... Um, at the very basic level of animals, like the simpler animals, we're going to look more closely at some of their cells versus by the time we get to mammals, we're not really even going to look at cells at all, right? The second thing is most animals will have higher levels of organization um, within their cells. So they may have their cells um, connect together to form tissues, tissues connect together to form organs, and then organs work together as organ systems. And now organ systems can, you know, they've got to communicate with each other too, like you can't have a digestive system without it being connected to the circulatory system um, and things like that. So, um, 
but some organisms were and some groups of animals we're going to look at we're going to look at a simpler like cell level or tissue level and then as we go through the year or the semester rather um and learn more and more like complex animals we're going to focus more at an organ level and then organ um, system level um all right so within the animal kingdom we two broad categories we separate um, the animals into is invertebrates and vertebrates. Invertebrates are going to be animals that do not have a backbone or a vertebral column. And there are eight major phylum. We're going to focus on nine total phyla. We're going to mention an, one or two extra here or there. Um, but out of all the phyla, we're going to focus on um, eight invertebrate phyla. Um, and then the other category is vertebrates, which do have a vertebral column or a backbone. And there's one major phyla of that, which we are included in as humans, um, and that's the phylum chordata. Right. So again, there's going to be nine phylum we talk about. So like within the kingdom, like so we're in the kingdom animalia, the next level, which we'll talk about these classification levels in a, um, in a future set of notes in a couple days. Um, but there's... The next category of breaking, separating things into is called phyla. So there's nine large um, phylums we're going to focus on. And again, we're going to touch on one or two extra here or there. But these are the nine main ones that we're going to go over really br briefly so you can get an idea of what we're going to spend the rest of the semester on after this unit. So the phylums are Porphyria, Nidaria, Echinodermata, Platyhelminthes, Nematoda, Analyta, Mollusca, Arthropoda, or Arthropoda, um, and Chordata. The word phylum is a singular term, and if you're speaking of more than one phylum, then you it's standard to say phyla, but I'm not going to lie. I'm going to probably say phylums quite a bit because, I mean, that's just how it is. Um, all right, so just breaking down and giving a brief overview of each phylum, um, Porphyria, this is the first phylum we'll look at in the next unit. It's the simplest of all animals. They don't have tissue layer, so in this phylum we're going to focus a lot on the cell level of how it transports nutrients and does some other stuff. Um, an example of some organisms in this phylum is sponges. So like SpongeBob falls into this phylum. And then here are just some ex um, examples of what sponges look like um, if you've never seen them before. The next phylum is Nidaria. This group this phylum we're going to pair with Porphyria for the next unit, so we'll do both of those in the same unit. Um, these guys are going to have a hollow body. They are pretty much all of them are going to have some sort of stinging cell, um, and they generally come in two body forms, which are medusa and polyps. Medusas are um, like jellyfish shaped, where their stingers are at the um, at the bottom, and then polyps are like sea anemones, where the stingers are at the top. Right, and we'll get into that more in that unit. But examples that fall into this category are coral, sea fish, um, sea, fish, uh, um, sea anemones, and jellyfish. Um, so it is quite, um, they are, it's a broad group of organisms. They're really fascinating in a lot of um, ways. So um, that's unit two, or those two phylums. The third um, phylum we'll look at is Echinodermata, or Echinoderms for short. Um, you don't have to say the full name. Their name means spiny skin because they generally have little spines or spikes on them. And they're only going to be found in marine environments. And examples include sea urchins, sea stars, and brittle stars. And here's some examples of those guys. All right. Um, next up is um, Platyhelminthes. Platyhelminthes is the first of our worm phylums. Um, these guys are unsegmented worms, despite that tapeworms look like they have technically like little segments. It's a little different with these guys, but they're flat bodies, which is why they got the name flatworms. Examples include planaria, fluke worms, and tapeworms in this. The second group um, of worms is nematodes or nematoda. They are also unsegmented worms. Um, they are called round worms is their nickname. So we've got flatworms and round worms, the difference being their body shape. Flatworms are flat, round worms are round. Um, hookworms and heartworms. So a lot of this we'll look at like pets and animals and how they infect um, other animals. They're rather kind of gross. And then the last group of worms is analyta or analids. Um, they are segmented worms. They're the most advanced out of the three groups of worms. Um, examples include leeches and earthworms. So like a leech doesn't really appear that it's got segments, but if you look really closely, you can kind of see the little ridges. So those three groups of worms will f um, have all in one unit together. All right. And then the next one is mollusk or mollusca. This will be paired with echinodermatas in um, the same unit. And these guys are one of my favorite phylums because they're just so 
fascinating to me. Um, so mollusks have, a lot of them are going to have a shell, but not all of them. They're going to have unsegmented soft bodies. So they're um, like an octopus or a snail like that. They are very soft, except for the shell part of the snail. Um, so examples include snails, scallops, slugs, squids, and octopus. So there's quite a range in there. Um, and they're just kind of really, really neat. So the next group is arthropoda or pata um, or arthropods, as I just shortened it. Um, they are segmented animals. They have exoskeletons and examples include shrimp, lobsters, crabs, and insects. So this is one of the broadest phylums of all of them because you've got not only insects, but then you've got like crabs, lobsters, and the stuff in the ocean. Um, so this will be a unit on its own um, since it is so broad. And then the last phylum is chordata, which um, they have a nerve cord or a notochord. Um, th there are a few invertebrate chordates, um, which we'll actually sneak those in on the arthropod test just because um, it's just easier to put them. And then we'll break the rest of them down into two different units. Um, so examples of these guys include fish, reptiles, birds, amphibians, and mammals. So typically we'll break down the units and do um, fish, reptiles, and amphibians on a test, and birds and mammals on a test. Um, so these this will be two units, and honestly it's probably most people's favorite because these are the animals that you really know um, well. So that's it for part one notes. Um, if you've got any questions, please let me know.